welcome to your daily game face. I'm still getting used to this that I have to wait for myself to pop on the screen. Yeah. And we're all getting used to it. Well, let me finish my intro now. Wait. Okay. Yep. Good morning. Welcome to your daily game face. I'm Dr. Kim Lannon, and the new system that we've got going live is confusing me. <sighs> we'll get now, it. Now, now, yep. now, oh, we'll get now, 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 now. Just when you see yourself, that's all. I saw myself, but there's like a delay. God. No, actually, with this system, there's no delay. You're seeing it real time. Now you're telling me what I'm seeing and how I'm feeling. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, in this instance, I have the technology to do that. Okay, Eeyore. Yeah. Really? <laughs> I'm just having a discussion here. <laughs> so good morning, Lou. Good morning. Lou, what did I bring you this morning? Huckleberry jam. Is that jam or jelly? What's the difference between jam and jelly? Um... I have no idea. Oh, it says jelly, I think, right? Does it say jelly or jam? No, it says jam. See, so jam. jam is probably like that. What I see in my head, I have a visual. I don't know this, but jam is more like when you, you know, when you get cranberry sauce in a can, oh, it's more. It's a little chewy. It's got, well, no, because it doesn't, I already tasted it. It's not chewy. Stop it. No, I didn't mean that. I mean, so, but you know how it's got that more condensed feel versus the runny feel. And I think of jelly is more like smooth and running i don't know that's just my take and wing on jelly it. is a clear fruit spread made from cooked fruit juice and sugar and pro possibly pectin which helps it gel and thicken jam is a thick spread made from fruit juice chopped to crush a pureed fruit or sugar pectin can also be added to help it gel but jams are usually looser than jellies see this is what i said yeah without all the technical terms i was right excellent <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I brought you huckleberry jam because yes. I forgot it last week from Montana, directly off the mountains. I hope you like it. Yeah, it'll be a muffin tonight, English muffin tonight with uh, almond butter and huckleberry really huckleberry jam. jam. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, anyway. So Did you have any we... huckleberry? What? Did you have any huckleberry while you I were had huckleberry. There? I had huckleberry Cooley, I had huckleberry martinis, I had huckleberry sauce, I had huckleberry dessert, ice cream stuff. I had every day, I think I had something huckleberry. How would you compare it to, I, well, to like berries we normally deal with? I like huckleberries a lot. So, even on the mountain, I think I told you last week, we were walking along the mountain and like people were picking them and handing them to people. So, you know, of course, yep. taking them away from the bears. But, um, but I like them. They're, um, I like them better than blueberries. Do you? Yes, I do. They have, I, I'm not, blueberries often are very sour to me. So, you know, it's one of those things. But I like huckleberries. They're very lovely. So Blasphemous. Now, you New Englander, that's blasphemous. I know. I'm not a big blueberry fan. Sorry. I'll pick them out. I'll eat them if I have to, but I'll pick them out before. Raspberries, yes. Blueberries, yeah. You know, they're kind of like annoying. They get in the way. <laughs> but I'll, I'll make a really good wild blueberry pie with like the little ones. Ooh, nice. Yeah. yeah. I'll like those. The big ones sometimes, yeah. So I digress. See, I like the bigger ones. <laughs> <laughs> we could have so many different conversations here. <laughs> so anyway, so how's your week? Uh, so far, so good. Uh, Short week, right? Labor Day. Oh yeah, I forgot. Whatever. Yep. Yeah, right. exactly. I'll be traveling the remainder of this week. So, do you know where I'm going? No, where are you going? I'm going to the Human Baton and the Veterans Trust. Our big um 9-11 tribute weekend to veterans and first responders down in Fort Lauderdale, Las Olas Park. We're doing a huge event for first responders and veterans of all the military um, backgrounds um, to, you know, with, we're going to jump out of the plane. We're going to get in the drift car. We're going to get in the rally car. Then we're going to run the boats. When you say we, are you jumping out of the plane? I will not be jumping out of the plane, as you know, <laughs> but we, as in the team of the human baton, because yeah. that's my capacity being down there this weekend. Um, I will also be there with IBR, which is what I'm wearing today is the in, um, inflatable boat racing for U.S. Um, with um, their group um, that does the IBR, and then we will, but we will be having the batons that have been in training yes. for the, you know, our race series and show that we've been doing and getting ready for. We'll be filming this weekend and doing other things. Um, but if you're in the Fort Lauderdale area or the Las Olas Park area, certainly come down and see us. It's a free event, and it 
goes to benefit, which is the benefit I was at last week um, with the Human Baton athletes. Um, it benefits the Veterans Trust Foundation. It benefits, there it is on your screens right now, Tribute to America's Heroes, September 11th, yes. um, 10 years later. Was it tw oh, 20 years later. I thought it said 10. I'm like, wait, that's <laughs> wrong. What? Um, so it's a great event. It's free and it's, you know, family friendly. It's going to be the whole park. We have the entire, um, if you've ever been down to Los Olas Park, it's this beautiful little uh, park that's just um, right on the beach and uh, has a great space for family events and food trucks and all kinds of really neat things. So we'll have all these really cool drift cars and race cars and sounds like a nice trip cool boats yeah. and um, it will be offering different experiences for people that want to get in those cars or ride those boats. Really? But, um, yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, and the, the gala that we were at last week with the, with a lot of the athletes, um, some people had bid on being able to go up in one of the, um, the fighter jets and do other things. So there's, it's a, oh. it's going to be a fantastic People went up in the fighter jets? Um, they haven't gone yet, but they bid on it oh. too. And the money went to the Veterans Trust Foundation and to the Top Gun Foundation um, to bring suicide awareness um, for um, some of the some of the groups do stuff on suicide awareness and um, prevention for military and first responder personnel. Um, given 9-11, this was in honor of all the people who obviously perished in 9-11 and also people who were first responders and all the military that helped um and so on and so forth so and it's a big weekend anyway because it's 9-11 which you know yeah it's one of those things and and obviously i i don't think i mentioned it last year maybe i did that my my college roommate passed away in the plane crash into the towers oh really so no, um every yeah. year it's a it's a reminder of chris carstangen who god rest his soul died in the tower crash um, one of them. One so, of the flights, yeah. Yeah, the United Airlines flight. I always forget what number it was. The uh, One of the best interviews I've ever done over the years, one of my favorite interviews, was with the Lieutenant Colonel uh, Ro Robert Dowling, was his name. Mm -hmm. And he was a Marine One pilot for Clinton. Mm -hmm. And under Bush, he was in the uh, office of the military that arranged the presidential trips. Yeah. So he was in the White House because the president was away from the White House at the time. And, of course, 9-11 happened, and he ended up in the bunker as the military liaison to Cheney yep, with Condoleezza Rice. Oh, wow. And the, the stories he told, and um, I was surprised at the time. He goes, did you have to get military clearance to tell me, the, tell stuff? He wrote a book, of course. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, but they didn't give me any problems at all. He just wrote the book, and he's talking about the evacuation of the White House. And it was like over the PA, women, leave your heels in the office. Just get out. Yeah. That's how, that's how, yeah. That's how they're scrambling the White House at that point. Wow. And uh, of wow. course, uh, the, have to the plans for dealing with Flight way. 93, which was headed into Washington right. at the time, they didn't know so what they was going on. They rerouted out to the field yeah. in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How long goes that interview? Uh, that interview goes back 10 years. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love to hear it. So you'll have to think forward I have it along. I think to I have it in a drawer here. Because, like I said, of all the interviews I've done, it's one of the ones I, that stands out to me the most. I got you. Yeah. So um, really quick question, because mm -hmm. because I'm not seeing um, people post up today. And I did have that question, Lou, not to put you on the spot, but people were wondering if they still find us on Facebook Live or if because we've changed our way of. Oh, no, we're on Facebook okay, Live. Okay, because people said last week that they were having a hard time seeing. So Really? Yeah. So I just want to make sure because I didn't know if people were not saying anything. And usually I see lots of comments and today I'm not seeing them. So I wanted to make sure that we. We have a comment. <laughs> I just distracted Lou. Lou's like, oh, God. We have a comment from Artie. Artie's. Oh, now Artie. Hello, yeah. Artie. Okay, now I've got something. Okay. All right. Yes. All right. So anyway. We're I, fascinating, so they're listening. Yes. I'm just <laughs> they're not commenting. <laughs> We're so fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Well, so well, I want to see that and I want to hear your Oh, interview. by the way, I want to make an announcement too. Oh, you do. Yes. We're still up on Facebook. It's just the way we're doing it is different, not the delivery system. So we're still up on Facebook Live, still available on all our podcast outlets. Yes. Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. And we've added uh, Amazon Music and Audible. We're on the Audible awesome. app, if you have the Audible app. So if you have Formally the Audible app, you can hear yeah. me there too. Yep. Good. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, I will make sure that I put that out there as well this next week that people, because people love using their Apple and their Audibles. Um, and and I love that Artie calls me Kim Kim. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, so, so that was one of my topics today, not Artie, but um, <laughs> talking about, you know, veterans because I thought that that was important given the 9-11 coming up. 
um, and first responders. And I was at dinner last night talking with some lovely people who I adore and love. And we were discussing like the suicide rate and um, in veterans particularly and talking about the different foundations like the Wounded Warrior Foundation and the, the project. And then, you know, obviously the Top Gun Foundation, the Veterans Trust. And there's all these different um outlets out there for helping veterans for a variety, you know, families right. of veterans and, uh, you know, people who lost their, their loved ones to either suicide or in action. Um, but just the bringing awareness to the amount of stress and PTSD or PTSG, P you know, post-traumatic stress growth, if no one is like really yeah. having too many complications with it, um, really bringing awareness to what that is and how in amazingly intense that is for people and um how it's not just like your typical anxiety disorder or something that's like oh that makes me feel anxious um and what kind of pressure that puts on someone to make them feel like you're so hopeless that you have to commit suicide and complete that um so bringing that awareness to uh because it's it's yeah. pretty high numbers given um, for a variety of reasons. And people keep asking me the reasons and some of them are kind of straightforward and some of them are controversial because people don't like caring about the fact that the lack of services um, that are provided or the, the length of time and lag time in giving services to some uh, veterans and or active military and also first responders, um, particularly more military and, and veterans than first responders, yeah. there seems to be a much better stress um, stress management program in place for a lot of the police departments and fire departments than, than I have encountered in the past 20 years than yeah. in the veterans well, population. They're unionized. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's one reason. There's the controversy. I've, I've been curious the last few days. Yeah. Um, do incidents like, I mean, we're going to be remembering 9-11 and obviously that's not a military thing, but it's the type of trauma that military personnel went through. Right. Of course, we had Kabul uh, a week or so ago. Yes. And uh, on Plum Island this weekend, they had the uh, moving Vietnam veterans wall yes. up at the airport. And I'm wondering, I mean, obviously people like to see something like the Vietnam wall, wall but does it stir up things? Does sure. it aggravate things? Did Kabul, even though it wasn't their theater and wasn't their group of military people, does that um, rile up problems with military veterans so so from a clinical perspective yes and no the yes is it rall it, it rallies the symptoms to pop up in people who go untreated and that doesn't mean they have to be medicated or in formal treatment it means that they haven't really done some type of their own settling work on it right mm -hmm. you don't have to go into therapy right. for it. you don't have to have medication for it but you've processed it, will, it to some point you've processed it in some way many people haven't so for most people that haven't the clinical that i would go with is that that would be the type of person that it would be more likely to rile up now the no on that is that many people who are either still active or they're most retired or, or veterans, they don't seek out news. They don't watch for that. They don't hear about it. So they are less likely to be yeah. riled up. Um, so there's a, there's a good and a bad to that or a healthy and an unhealthy side to that is that they may not have processed it, but they also don't seek out things to get it riled up. Right. Um, for people that have processed or are in the process of processing it, they are more likely to be riled up because more raw, it's, there's something that they're already thinking about. There, there may be, you know, weekly or biweekly therapy, or they're going to groups on it, or they're belong to a veterans foundation where there's camaraderie, where the guys or the women are talking about it a lot, or at least more than often than not. So it's that it gets pushed up, but it may be in different ways, yeah. you know, it can come out in a little bit different ways, which is why, you know, channeling into something like this big motor motorsport experience or, um, Lots of 5Ks happened this weekend for the 9-11 experience and first responders and for veterans. And, um, you know, so yeah. all those kinds of things are a way to sublimate psychologically. The question that you just asked is that, you know, a lot of people push themselves into these other things to manage it. Um, but by and large, I mean, certainly people get um, triggered by it. I mean, you're certainly there's people that live off in the isolation in the woods kind of thing yeah. and people live on their own and they don't come out. There's a guy that lives down the street from me that lives in 
I call it in reclusiveness, you know, his hat, like he has, he has a beautiful house sitting in the middle of like a stark green lot with nothing around it. All the shades are always pulled. And, you know, you have to wonder like, that's not very healthy. Right. You know, occasionally I'll see him out there mowing his lawn, but he's very reserved into himself. And I have this narrative. I've never really talked to him other than say hi, which he doesn't say hello back, but there's a narrative in my head about knowing all the veterans I've known for the past, you know, almost 30 years what his storyline is and what makes him reserved and reclusive mm -hmm. because you know you don't you don't put yourself in anybody's way then there's no harm coming kind of just stay to yourself so um healthy some people would say well he's protecting himself but also not really healthy because it's very disconnected and puts most people in a position where they're in they're in jeopardy right. of self-harm you know alcoholism drugs this man isn't, I can, I can tell Yeah, one of the things I can read, but, yeah. but that's typically what you see, um, as an experience there. And this type, this time of year, just like the Vietnam veterans and, you know, I've, I've worked with many Vietnam veterans who, you know, they'll get together around certain anniversary times or, you know, you know, the Tet Defense or something like that. And they'll do, you know, around certain wars or they'll get together and there's a lot of drinking involved, a lot of like storytelling, and that's a way of processing, but that's not happening all year long versus people that do it every day. So right. you just, it's just a variety of different responses. Talk about the parts of, um, cause you touched on something I thought might be a key component to dealing with this, but it kind of went the other way at the end. Talk about balancing the uh, processing it by remembering it mm -hmm. and the, um, treating it by staying in the present. In other words, not how do you deal with it, but not dwell on it, I guess is, is the difference. So when you have a good, healthy psychological therapeutic process happening, you're basically teaching or guiding your, your veteran or your, or, or veterans together are guiding each other to remain in the moment, staying present today. And you know how it's like, it's like grieving. It's, you're discussing what has happened or you're, or you're present about the fact that this has happened with respect and honor. And, you know, sounds weird. It's celebration, but it's not, it's more of like a, just a remembrance, solemn um, camaraderie. You know, that's the what veterans and first responder and group shared the camaraderie of the universal shared experience to get together and really process it together. So when they're doing that, it's, building or reaffirming that bond that they have together mm -hmm. and then um, giving that sense of purpose, resiliency, like I talked about last week, being relevant and resilient of why did we do this? Why was this important? What, you know, was it for nothing? Cause so many, you know, yeah. I mean, I could, this is hours and hours of a show to talk about, you know, what the meaning for all these different types of things are. And again, and, the with for Vietnam vets, the withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan right. was so parallel. Right. And and raises the same questions about the action and the and the deaths during the time period. And and so that's part of the, you know, the ability for a veteran to or a, an active duty military person to be able to really talk about and debrief. Now, when people are typically active military, there will be controversy, I'm sure, about this, because some people say that's not true. But it in my experience clinically is that if you're active military, you're not talking about it because you're not supposed to, because that can get you you know, flags in your record that you're having trouble with it, you know, if you talk about it a certain way. So um, that's why people come outside of the veteran or yeah. the active military units to talk to someone on the outside and civilian world like I am because right. it doesn't go in the record. Yeah. Um, but it absolutely exists that there's such a struggle with um, being able to talk about something while you're active duty because it's frowned upon. Um, people will say that's not true, <laughs> but that's yeah. the... That's yeah. the face that has to be right. shown because yeah. everyone wants to make it. But this is one of the reasons why we have people then retire or become veterans and, and leave, you know, you know, discharge from the military and then struggle because there was no real debrief. There is a debrief, debrief process that's definitely better and different than it used to be. But it's basically, oh, everything's OK. Good. You're on your way. Yeah. Um, I have a veteran that I just he's a police officer um, now and he um is disability connected for PTSD to the military for serving overseas many years ago. Um, and, and his, you know, when he was declined his um, initial PTSD assessment, when I gave it because he, on his exit interview, 
basically said, everything's good. And his reasoning to me was totally reasonable. He said, I just didn't, I'm, I just want out. Yeah. I didn't want to get into it. I didn't want to have them tell me you're fine. I didn't want them to minimize Plus, my experience. I just wanted them to say, okay, you're good yeah. out. They were so, looking for a problem. They weren't looking to help. Right. They, they just want to make sure you're okay. Good. Yeah. And he was like, I'm going to play the game. I just want out. I don't want to have any problems. I don't want them to tell me like, you know, well, yeah. let's give you this group for six months. <laughs> He's like, I just wanted out. And so we had to, we had to piecemeal the puzzle together so that it had proof, which is so crazy to have to think about yeah. and talk about strain on someone who has PTSD for seeing terrible, awful things and feeling like they were going to die in a hot second that we had to prove that he actually felt bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's it, so Th going back to several of your questions that his self-diagnosis wasn't uh, wasn't necessarily legitimate when he when he left the military right yeah right so, everyone's taking his word for how he you know how he feels exactly he's still processing everything exactly and well and that's the other thing is and i make a case for that a lot when i do disability claims for for veterans is that i mean we know that in ptsg and and uh, acute stress disorders that acute stress can come right on but you can go I've had veterans that have gone years out of being in the military and then all of a sudden it comes on them. That's not uncommon. Yeah. Um, Plus and, your military training tells you to deny hardship. Well, yeah, because you have to still push through. Right. So there's the resiliency piece I was talking about last week is how resilient are you? You know, it's like when you're trained to be a sniper, for instance, I'm using that extreme. When you're trained to be a sniper and that's your job, that's not just, oh, they give you a gun and you go out and you shoot it. <laughs> there's a really specific way of doing this and it's a very specific person that they pick with a certain type of resiliency mentally. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, that's what great movies are made of about being snipers because they're very mentally tough in a very different way than your kind of everyday person. But that doesn't mean that they still don't have impact of what they do or have done. Cause you know, many times snipers have killed people yep. and, and how to then process that. So I do have several people in my, practice over the years and currently that are in that breed and then in comparison to others it's what a difference in the mental yeah. intensity of how they experience any kind of ptsd they still experience ptsd but they don't report it quite in the same way they don't experience it quite in the same way as the other but they both you know both people have it but it shows differently um based on the resiliency and the mental fortitude because i have to accept a certain level of stress they have to accept right. a certain level of trauma because right. that was the job right so and account well yeah. and accountability yeah. responsibility and is is one able to um dispose of or contain the level of impact that they've had doing some of the things that they've done right um you know m several i won't say many several of my veterans that i have currently um struggle with the things that they did because it went against their ethic and moral core. Right. Um, but they never thought they'd be able to do the things that they did. And now that eats them up Yeah. with the guilt and the shame and how they'll be judged and how they get judged. And they don't want anyone to know, which ob is obvious. Sure. Um, but that's something you never think going in. Well, what that's typical of world war two veterans, right. they don't talk right because they can't, they can't reconcile what they had to do in the military during world war ii as opposed to being a person in everyday life well so here's so here's what i because group therapy i'm going to give you a little lesson today ready mm. so group therapy and i teach this in my in my summer class group therapy actually stemmed out of the history of it comes from being in the military world war one really essentially and world war ii are the starters for that because of group therapy because the um research loosely used research that was being done with guys mostly guys i'm not being sexist here but mostly the men that were coming back from these two particular wars and some women but mostly the men they were coming back and i'm making sure i use the right terms they they were okay and i'm that's not to yeah. demean or minimize they were okay and here's why what they found was and this is why group therapy is such a um, wonderful tool now and what because we use these um there's 11 therapeutic factors that we know have come from wartime groups that have been successful in being okay yep. coming back um, is that 
the universal shared experience of going in together as a platoon and brigade and all coming out together. In World War I and World War II, there was no man left behind, literally. So all people went in and that whole, like 30 people went in, all 30 came back, whether they were dead, whatever piece they were, they yeah. were coming back together as a group. By the time they got to Vietnam, yeah, that was not happening. So you, so the group, the group process of the universal shared experience and the cohesiveness and bond, which is the number one therapeutic factor in a group, it, the more cohesiveness that the group has, whether they get along or not, but if they shared the same experience, even if they were from all sides of the world, different colors, different religious backgrounds, didn't matter. And what mattered was, is they had shared that experience. They were so cohesive because they knew that they all knew the same experience. Yeah. And therefore they had hope. Therefore they knew that someone had their back. There were all these 11 factors that protected them. We know that all a the AA groups, all the groups now that are done are all based on the research that came out of World War One and Two, knowing that that was all the protective factors that made people not have the suicidality then when they came back, which is different than Vietnam. Because in Vietnam, it started that way. But what ended up happening is it gets so out of control, as we know, that the, the, the platoon would go in, 15 people would get killed. They wouldn't all come out. They'd send 20 more in that were new and there was no cohesion to the group. Right. And then it was, you know, who was top dog? You know, you've seen yep. it dramatized in Platoon, the movie and other things um, that, you know, which is very different than when you watch like um, Saving Private Ryan. Those are pretty good examples of yeah. the differences in how, th you know, it's like saving private Ryan. You can tell this whole experience I'm talking about is like right there versus, you know, they were all together versus like the deer hunter. I would also imagine that the morality was somewhat different in the world wars as opposed yes. to what came later, because um, there was a very clear enemy. There was a threat to family. There was a threat to home. There was a reason you needed to do what you needed to do. Right. Vietnam was less clear. Right. Uh, mor morally, it was less clear. And you came home and you were um, told not to talk about it. Well, it was a shame based thing. You were, you were shamed by the country. I mean, people were people didn't embrace Vietnam veterans right. when they came back. They right. ignored Korean veterans. And right. Uh, basically yeah, Korea gets completely ignored. Afghanistan and Iraq right now is basically part of life. Veterans right. come, veterans go. World War Two, they came home to a hero's welcome. They went right. and fought, fought a a morally clear enemy. Right. Yeah. Right. So they didn't have the conflicts that you had to do what you had to do because of what you were, the threat that was presented to you. Well, and that's part of the cohesiveness and the universal shared experience is that the the world or the United States in that in this regard for the research was everyone was together, even on the outskirts, whereas it starts falling apart as we have future further on wars is that you don't have the onboard process of everybody doing that. So the protective factor goes away. And when you have that, so if you just take a, a typical today, 2021 individual veteran or first responder, and they don't have that, that support system around them, like I just gave as that example, they're going to be way more vulnerable to suicide, alcoholism, drugging, violence, agitation, self-harm, all those things. Then, uh, you know, and that's not saying all. I'm using this as the extreme, but that's what, when we talk about people who end up committing suicide or, or you know, the guys even on the Capitol in, in January that have since committed suicide, their level of resiliency or their, la their feeling, I would imagine, I certainly didn't talk to them, but just knowing what I know psychologically and knowing this history, I would imagine the isolation and the feeling of overwhelmed, you know, fear of imminent death and the fear of like yeah. reprisal and all these things that go into PTSD just overwhelms the system. And the hopelessness that comes that there will never be anything that will resolve it out leads down that path. And it's awful. Yeah. Especially when um, the intent that you tried to live by was for good in the moment. It yeah, it was for good and largely misunderstood. Exactly. Vietnam veterans who were trying to do the right thing. I mean, many of them were drafted in and right. brought in involuntarily. Right. But they were trying to do the right thing, thought they were doing the right thing. Right. And, and America told them they weren't. Right. And January 6th is another great example of that. Right. And it just goes forward. I want to go back to the question of dwelling in the past as opposed to processing the past. Right. And it sounded like in your answer, one of the key components, and I, I guess maybe I tend to oversimplify, so. 
you correct me if I oversimplify. And I will. Yeah. It, it sounds like the key is context. In other words, it, when you go back and talk about the past or think about the past, if you can maintain, if you can maintain a present context, yeah, as can, opposed to actually traveling back into the past and reliving the trauma. Well, right. So, so traveling back to the past in psych terms is, you know, reliving the experience or recapitulating the experience or having flashbacks, feeling the fear, feeling right, the fight you know, or flight, really yeah. being present. So if yeah. you're staying in the moment of, so when I do a group with veterans, like I have Vietnam vets that I work with, right. And I've done, and I do groups with them. When I've sat in the groups with them, we stay in the here and now, which is the, the basic theoretical framework to keep people present. Right. Um, and that's very famous theorist Yalom, who was from this area, who, who, who did this research. Um, if you stay perspective driven, like here you are right now, that was then we can talk about it as then, but we don't bring it into the present to um, re-experience it, to flash it back, to um, have relitigate it. it. Right. Yeah. So we, we keep present with the group of people that we're with, or if I'm sitting with an individual, it's, you know, if you start having experience, it goes beyond that, you know, or smell. Cause I have a lot of veterans that can generate a smell yeah. in their, in their brain. Cause there's so many mirror neurons that can generate from the trauma that they, you know, smell is very memory attached, right? It's, it's, um, yeah. Yes. Sound, smell, taste. So when, remember back when the Iraq, or, yeah, for example, we, call up the smell of sausage subs on Lansdowne street. No. Yes. Oh yes. I, it's true. You, you can do it on demand. Tar, but yeah. Yes. So, so you have any smell can give you great memory because it's going towards yeah. your cortex and your mirror neurons and making you feel something, right? So mm -hmm. it's an association factor to feeling in the limbic system, which is giving that emotional response. So if we talk about being down at Fenway and smelling the sausages and all that, or going into Gillette Stadium for a Patriots game and you smell, I go right to beer and pizza. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so it's that, you know, you get that and you get the sounds and all these things that stimulate your emotions. When we're talking about I was going to say that I have guys that have been like in right at the beginning when the Iraq war started and there, it wasn't even, no, it wasn't. It was the OIF. It was the, um, it was desert storm, not Iraq. So it was desert mm -hmm. storm and all the oil fields were burning and they had that smell. The guys would tell me about this terrible tar smell and how, um, the gas, it was not gas, but it was like an oily tar smell. So now I never had that experience, right. but every time I smell like tarred roads being tarred, I have like the empathetic response for them. Talk about like crossover, you yeah. know, I'm totally aware of it, but I've had, um, veterans who I, you know, I walk and talk sometimes with them outside and we've been walking on the summer and so the, one of the roads will be being tarred and I've lost veterans in their head, like going completely out of perspective of here and now into another moment. And I've yep. had to say, okay, we're here, we're here, you know, and, and there's some techniques that I do to keep it, but you can see when they go because the smell comes up. Sure. And it's, um, but keeping that context represses fight or flight, the right. emotions of it and allows you to process it. Well, I mean, you can't process it while you're there right. fighting through the emotions. Exactly. So maintaining that present day context is important. Well, so I, I learned this in a very interesting, I, I mean, my vet that I have finds this to be now a very entertaining story, but my very first exposure to a PTSD experience <laughs> full on was I was sitting in an office with a Vietnam vet and I'm not sure what made this particular VA think it was a really good idea to fly a helicopter into the center of the quad of all the veterans without warning us. Um, so I'm doing therapy with this man and all of a sudden this helicopter outside the window comes like, I mean, literally from me to you, like, a, right. It's like, you know, yeah. you know, coming in and, and he grabbed me and pulled me under the table in the office. We, we have panic buttons and I'm like, Oh my God, am I going to have to do it? Cause I didn't know what's going on. Right. Right. Because I, you know, this is 20 something years ago or whatever, 25 years ago. And, and he's like, get down, get down. And he started talking as if he was there. And I immediately knew, but it was that moment of, I had to like transition in my, in my present moment of saying, what the heck is going on yeah. and from right into, Oh my God. Cause he was like, get down, get down. I, I, you know, he's, I can't remember now it was get down, get down. And then I just remember being calm saying, it's okay. It's just a helicopter coming in. They're doing an active. I didn't know what they were doing. I just blah, blah, blah. <laughs> happens every talking. day. I was yeah. like, Oh my God, I'm so overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah. But it was, 
so fascinating that I was part of that in the moment, like we were in Vietnam, he had worked on an ammo dump. He was like, that used to happen to him all the time that they would come in and he never knew if it was going to be attack or not. And he was talking all that language. And I could just, I felt, you know, the empathy that I felt for him, that what a scary experience that, you know, when people say fireworks or helicopters or planes flying overhead of for someone that's been in the military and had these experiences and what it feels like to have because those are all signs of imminent death. Think of the Fear power of, of that. Yes. Because you're you're battling and winning against the current context, all mm -hmm. the visual and auditory stimulus that you're getting at the time. That's just wiped out by this memory coming back. Right. Yeah. I right. mean, think of the power of that. And 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 that's what happens. It's almost like the it gets wiped out in that moment. And to bring someone back into that is is very intense for a doctor like yeah. myself to do that. And it's also when you're, you're, you've been built into the experience, which has happened to me several times. Um, I learned a lot from veterans around this. I mean, half my, you know, half my practice, I would say is, is high end athletes. And 20% of my practice is like, you know, everyday kind of people, but the rest is all veterans and people active duty, as you know. So I see this all the time. But the principle, some continuum. the principle of this yeah. carries over into everyday life, not, yeah. to, not to compare the level of the two, of course, because war, war theater experiences are. And, right. Well, that's why I brought up resiliency and relevance yeah. last week. But there are a lot of people dealing with that same type of response yeah. on lower levels. And it's, it's disturbing. What they, I wouldn't say it's lower levels. I'd say it's different levels. Different levels. Yeah, because yeah, I don't necessarily say it would be lower because, I mean, someone who's had sexual assault or someone who had domestic violence or someone who's been in a really bad, tragic accident when lost, like, they're the same. Of course. I, I was talking oh, no. more about emotional, you oh, know. Okay. I yeah. just want to make sure that I didn't minimize yeah. that, like, you know, the. No, I, no, I wasn't. No, for those people, obviously right. not. It's the same okay. type of trauma. Okay, so what were you saying? I'm sorry. Uh, just people generally in day-to-day -day -day life flashing back to conflicts they have with their parents. Oh, yeah. Conflicts they had with an ex, uh, uh, you know, anything. I, a lot of people slip back into the past. Yes. And can be triggered really easily. Yes. Especially at varying points in between relationships and things like that. But th the principles still apply. Well, those things that happen, and it's a great point. So I'm glad that you clarified that because, yes, everyday life, we are always r ruminating or keeping ruminations at bay about things that happen in the past or that come, you know, threat of the past and threat of the right. future. Right. So those, those associations are what keep us, you know, defending ourselves, keeping us away from getting hurt emotionally. Um, or we bring them up as a way sometimes, I mean, it sounds weird, but it's a psychological phenomenon that will repeat the past in our heads because we're getting something out of it, even if it's painful. We'll dance with the devil we know. We'd rather have some of the pain that we know than not. So we'll go back to the association. And there's a lot of mental association neurons, you know, smell, taste, touch, memory, all those things to make us go back mm -hmm. um, and re-injure ourselves self-sabotage or or keep pulling for the same experiences to happen one of the questions i get from people is why do in my classes particularly why do people who are in abusive relationships you know stay in abusive relationships and you know you get you know people say oh because they're stupid no it's because people continue to go into relationships that they know because they pull for those types of people psychologically and the, the, the abusers it's this it's a dance well it's like the only other things and because you're in the trauma of that yeah. and it keeps going and it's not because you're stupid at all it's because you're in a pattern of association that even though it's painful you you can't air quote and you can't get out because there's emotional ties there's financial ties there's gaslighting yeah. there's all kinds of things that have happened so many times that that becomes your norm you, know, you hear people, you know, kids, you know, that that kid that was kept in the closet for 15 years. Right. He he knew it was not right. But I mean, he also knew that that's what he knew. Yeah. You know, people grow up with what they know and then they're conditioned to. What do you mean that? What do you mean that couples say I love you? What do you mean that moms and dads don't hit? What do you mean? that Like, you know, it's, well, the only thing more fearful than past traumas is unknown. Right. Right. So, so you'll, you'll trade, you'll take the past that, you know, and survive to some extent. Right. And have an idea of how to deal with as opposed to the unknown traumas. Exactly. That, that you choose by getting getting out of an abusive relationship. For example. Right. And so and so when you have a veteran or you have a, a, a first responder, a police officer or whoever, you know, I, I always like to 
keep it present too for them too because there's a lot of people that are active duty still in all the branches that are still dealing with a lot of this that you know that they're working on this all the time and working still in the field and how you know going back to the suicide is like how to keep yourself present so you don't feel hopeless yeah. that you know that okay yet another call that takes me to another bad thing here's another call that puts me in harm's way here's another call that comes in and i could die you know because someone's attacking me and how to keep the traumas from the 70 other events that have happened before out of the presence so that you can still function and do your job. And that's one of the things that's super hard. And that's what gets overwhelming to police officers, for instance. I know I have a couple of police officers that are fighting this all the time is because they're in an area where they get a lot of calls that repeat the trauma, repeat the trauma. And to be present without falling over the cliff, so to speak, and freezing or feeling like they're overwhelmed and all those things is um, is really, we. I mean, it's probably some of the hardest work I do with them because I have to really be on top of it different than I have to with someone who's just talking about their life, their life skills of the day. And with um, police officers and first responders, EMTs, things like that, I imagine the real problem is that a lot of these traumas are going to be repeated. If you go into a domestic situation with a young child and you're traumatized by that, the experience that the child went through, you're going to run into another one yes. as a police officer down the road an EMT a child in an accident, you're going to run into another one down the road at some point, you know, it's, it's always lurking. Yeah. I have a, I have a police officer that, um, for whatever reason, his, 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 his poor fortune, his poor luck was that his trigger is he happened to get calls to in the past decade, probably seven or eight different hangings. Mm. So he, the triggers of hang like he sees them everywhere now yeah like it's you know not one you know the first one was one thing but then it was like boom 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 and then now he's you know he's pulled back from it we have to do a lot of like exposure therapy to like keep those visuals away from the stimulus field because it's such a um a limbics the limbic system is your emotional center it's such a trigger to the three areas of your limbic system the amygdala the hippocampus and the hypothalamus the one that remembers the one that gives you emotional regulation and then the one that gives you all sensation so, emotionally so we have to constantly be recalibrating recalibrating and that's if someone's not seeking out help like that from me and they're trying to do it on their own you know some do it successfully, some do alcohol, <laughs> right? Some do it through exercise and sport, which is great, you know, but it's, it's, what do those sets... professions have the same standards for trauma? In other words, will they bench e e EMTs, for example, that are showing that express that they're struggling? No, no. not in my experience. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure that there's anomalies out there on the board that some departments or some EMT companies will. Yeah. I haven't seen it. That's not to say it's not there, because I'm sure there's, there's... You wonder why it's not mandatory. I mean, the, with what these people have to do on a day-to-day -day basis in their jobs, you wonder why the things some that kind I of know, therapy wouldn't be mandatory. Well, the things I know that are mandatory now, like when there's like, you know, there's a bad call, someone's involved with a police officer shooting, or there's a fire or something like that, or an EMT thing, that they have, they, many, many, not all, many police departments, because I do consults for some of them, they will, they have an on-duty stress officer, and then they have a social worker or, or licensed mental health counselor that is there to debrief or to be there to offer services. Here's the downside. Many of the guys, because I see them on the outside, will tell me they're not going right. because you know what it does. Yeah. It sets them up for the stigma of the problem. So, um, and Plus it's, it's airing their laundry within their organization. Right. Which is... And that's obviously no -no, not desirable. Still that yeah. old, unfortunately, there's still that old boys club yeah. that you don't do that and you're not tough and you're, they, it's still a lot of that piece there that isn't, people will say, oh no, it's not. Yes, it is. Cause yeah. I hear, I can tell you, sure. I hear <laughs> the direct from their mouths that I'm not telling my sergeant, my captain, um, my guys I'm working with. Uh, no, I wouldn't the lieutenant, to... I'm not telling anybody because that makes me vulnerable. They'll think I'm not stable. Um, same as military. Same I wouldn't go exactly. to a therapist that was on the staff of my organization. Right. I mean, who would do that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. The whole, Which is, the whole idea of therapy is um, that uh, freedom and that isolation. Well, that's one of the things. Containment that, of your, your struggles. And that's one of the things that I think that was 
a good thing that the VA did, right? The VA met, you know, a few years back, it's still hard. I won't, I won't say anything negative, but <laughs> they created the, the cares program or the, you know, you get choice, choice care so that you can go outside the VA to see people and they'll pay for it. I have not had great success with having that work. Getting actually paid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, because they want to keep it in house. You know, yeah. that's my, you know, the, the guys tell me like, oh my God, they don't want me to go. They want me to be on the list of waiting. They want me to come here. They're, um, so they end up inevitably either paying me out of pocket or they get an additional insurance kind of thing. And that's my other colleagues and I talk about this all the time. The exact same thing happens. It's very difficult to get the choice care in, in theory. It's great, but it's not really working. Right. Um, but that was in response partially largely to the suicide issue that was happening of like people calling or coming and saying, I need services. And they'd say, okay, six months. Well, the person's suicidal now, the veteran is suicidal now. They're feeling like they're going to kill themselves tonight, yeah. but you're just told them to wait. So it's like, you're, you're, you know, adding fuel to the fire. You're not, not only do you have to wait, but you're, we're also sending the message that your issue isn't bad enough or right. you're not worthy enough or relevant enough for us to treat you now because you have to wait. Um, so, you know, so there's lots of really good things that have come in from the outside sources like myself and other members in my colleague group that we offer those services. And there's tons of people that have come out in the past 15 years to really offer suicide awareness, suicide prevention, um, like the local police departments around me all know that I offer those services. I'm willing to come in. They, you know, so and that's by and large much bigger of a process now than it ever was because there just wasn't the services and the guys, you know, you know, you go into the, um, the, if you're an active duty military member and you go into the VA, everything gets put into a record that everybody can see. Yeah. Now they can tell you that everyone has restricted access, but when I many years ago worked for a very quick brief second at the VA, I had access to everybody across the country's record. Yeah. So, sure. so they don't, and most of my guys that I've seen for 20 years now, you know, that was their biggest thing is like, you don't put anything in a record that anyone can see. Well, the military is puts organization first, right? Put the organization first above, mm -hmm. above your interests. Uh, which groups are, st are having the most trouble relatively, uh, active or recently active veterans, uh, Vietnam veterans, World War II veterans. Uh, oh, that's a hard, that's a hard question because everyone has their issues. Yeah. So um, for a long time, and, and this has changed a little bit over the past few years. And one of my students gave me the new statistics on it. He was great. He went and found them. And of course, I can't remember off the top of my head, but for a long time, about 10 years ago, maybe up until about five years ago, the biggest group that was struggling um, was anyone over the age of 60 to 65 white you know, Caucasian men, death by gun, Vietnam vet, and mm -hmm. World War II vet, because there was no processing. I mean, the, I mean I'm basic, yeah. you know, basic downing this. Yeah. It's like just, you know, they recently, you know, there were factors, recently widowed, no protective factor anymore, no social support network because their wife was the person or they were alone so long that finally they yeah. gave up and it was death by gun. And it was that age group, which was surprising to a lot of people because it's like, wow, that's, you know, and what was the, what were all those themes? It was that particular group. Um, now it's shifted. So I wouldn't necessarily say that that is, um, I think you've got a lot of different, I think the police, so the police department has been infiltrated of late with, you know, OIF and OEF veterans and people who have seen war and death and terrible awful things and have PTSD. So I think that the police departments have a lot of stress, um, plus add in the jobs in high risk areas. You know, you got certain areas, Boston, if you know, Chicago, wherever the hot cities are with lots, you know, Minneapolis. Yeah. Add <laughs> in the political environment of the last right. two years. Add, and, right. Yeah, and so yeah. you've got those pieces. So that puts them at risk. I think firefighters get overlooked a lot because firefighters aren't seen as, as having the same issues because it's just a fire. You know, I hear that all the time. It's like, well, you don't yeah. understand. Like there's a lot of work that goes into firefighting and also firefighters are first responders to EMT calls. Yep. They're the ones that, you know, you, the police officers come, but EMTs from the fire department who are the one they come from, they're the ones that see the car accident first. They're the ones that are doing life support. They're the ones that either keep you alive or watch you die. Like, I think that they get overlooked and the resiliency level for them um, is different because I think police departments don't provide the same 
just based on my experience, I'm sure people be like, that's not true, but mm -hmm. police departments don't provide the same camaraderie in the same way as a fire department. Fire departments right. live together, they right. cook together, they play together, their families all know each other. It's often intergenerationally bred that there's like fathers and sons and mothers and uncles and aunts all working together. So it's a little yeah. different of a protective factor. So you hear a little less when within terms of, of, of uh, military, from only my experience anecdotally, I can say that I would say that Air Force tends to be the less problematic with Marine and Navy and Army running for first, depending on context. Yeah. Um, Navy divers, Navy SEALs, higher level of incidences and other issues, but go unreported. I only know it because I see it because people come to me. Um, spec Ops people and don't typically seek out services from Marines and army, but when they do, it's significant and huge. So you got to imagine off of the, the few people I see of that, yeah. it's broad stroke, probably pretty significant. Um, and then, you know, anyone frontline, you know, arm, army's always infantry for the most part right. that you see, right? It's very rare that you get a commissioned officer that's going to be like, oh yeah, cause they're sitting in a bunker somewhere doing yeah. like, here, go do this. Right. So, but well, that's the air force thing, right? The right. detachment from the, Exactly. Detachment from the battle. From the reality of yeah. what's going on. And I was wondering if Navy ships were kind of the same way because there is a detachment there. But uh, Marines, Army guys, they're so they're, you they're have, all so the time. Yeah. so the Marines Marines and, especially. Yeah. Well, the Marines and Navy when they're detached on ships like that, you'll have a section of them that are detached, but they're not because they're doing the sub work. They're jumping in and out of the boats. They're running the they're running the missions. They're going off the decks. They're doing the yep. fighter pilot stuff. They're doing you know search, rescue, recovery, things that are happening and that go untalked about um, that I hear about. So yeah. I, just in my own experience, I would say that although the naval ships that carry Marines and Navy personnel on them are detached, um, there are select pods or sure. people that come in and off of those all the time that are always in harm's way, always in harm's way. Because someone has to put the boots on the ground and do the work. Right. At some right. point, and it's Marines often, you know, with the Navy. Marines and, and Navy, right? And the divers. Special Ops Navy will do right. that. Yeah. Underwater stuff, yeah. you know, sonar stuff, undetected security for the country, overseas, um, going in and out of certainly, you know, when it was Osama bin Laden, putting feet on the ground. That, yeah. There's all kinds of things that people don't hear about that I just know are happening just because the guys tell me. Yeah. Um, but I would say just in that anecdotal is that there's, they're all, they're all having stuff, but it just would be, you know, an air force doesn't get put in the same ways. And I'll have all these air force guys being like, that's not true. I can hear one of my guys right now being like, that's not true. But he would admit he does never had, he's been in, in country, but he's never had any danger. What are some of the signs if you um, you have a loved one who's a first responder or a military yeah. veteran that they that you should probably encourage them to seek some help? Um, so so men and women present a little differently. So typically you'll see mostly most of the time men. Um, so I'll, I'll address them first. But uh, agitation, a change in um, behavior, like your actual front on behavior. Like if you're not seeing anything else, like um, quick to be angry, um, a little bit more snappy, that's one. Or the opposite, which is become withdrawn and sullen, not speaking, uh, didn't decline in going places, not being engaged. So one part of that spectrum or the other, um, op some obvious things, you know, increase consumption of alcohol, um, increase consumption of smoking, um, whatever product, whatever yeah. they may pick, um, lack of sleep, insomnia or hypersomnia, too much sleep, oversleeping. Um, uh, and then uh, there's so many different little things like, a, you know, just, uh, you can have kind of that long distance stare, you know, person just not paying attention like these two, um, things that would go away from a baseline of what you knew the person as. So if you've been with someone for 30 years and, or even 10 years and they're different in yeah. some significant way of their functional level from 10 years ago when you met them and then all of a sudden they went away and did something and they came back and now you've got like these behaviors, um, more behavioral problems, getting in trouble. They might've been in trouble with the law, something like that, fighting more, um, being, uh, 
not present. There's, there's sometimes where yeah. people get really dissociated and they're just not present. Um, that's vast majority. Women, you won't see the same presentation in that way. If you're in like, at least in my experience, militarily wise, you'll see much more closeted things. And women are much more likely to seek out help. So they'll get help before they get to the point where you're right. seeing it in men. Men typically are at that point because they haven't done any work. Women are typically doing the work in some way, even if they're doing it on their own. Typically with women, you're either going to see some form of um, drug use, like out of it, like not drug use, but you're, you're they're getting prescriptions, but they're right. using them. They're having drinks. They're, you know, some promiscuity sometimes, you know, looking for affection and love because they feel empty. Um, but that's, I don't see that a lot in the women that I see. I usually see much tamer versions of any of it because they come and seek out help. Yeah. By the time I get most of the guys, they've already ramped up, gone over the cliff on some way, and we, yeah. we have an issue. Yeah. So whether it's a police officer. You're in triage at that point. We're, yeah, yeah, we're, we're yeah. putting the Band-Aid on the heart attack just to stop it from bleeding, and then we're fixing yeah. it, <laughs> usually. Sounds like a, the same advice I get from my pediatrician the first time I saw her with my firstborn. It's like trust your instinct, right? Mm -hmm. You see something you think uh, needs to be addressed, try to address it. Exactly. And, and, and people, you have to really pay attention. And, and, you know, this is, people are very into themselves, right? So you live with someone, you might think you are aware of them, but when you're in a situation where you live with a vet, with a person who's military or first responders or things like that, that's, that's a whole nother breed of a relationship because you really have to be yeah. paying attention, you know, in the non day to day stuff, if something has come up with trauma or tragedy or something, because the change can be so subtle. Yeah. You really have to watch for it and see what's like, you know, Plus, or, almost instinctively, they compartmentalize that yeah. part of their lives. Right. But some stuff seeps through on occasion. Well, and, and here and here's that may good, not make sense because you don't have the context. Well, and here's here's a good example of when it leaks through. And and oftentimes it's a aha moment for families. You know, someone will come in with their spouse and say, I just don't understand. You know, everything's been going great this year. And all of a sudden, blah, blah, blah happened. And now he's off his rocker or whatever. And I pick on men because usually guys. Right. Um and my first question always is, what anniversary are we at right now? What happened during September 11th of whatever, yeah, right? right? Or what happened in September? And it's almost always like, aha. And there's some usual, like, somebody died, they saw something. There's some yeah. trauma remembrance of anniversary, usually in that time period. Or sometimes I'll get guys that will say, I can't do February. I can't do March. Like, and I'll be like, what do you mean? And that's great because then we go, well, we're going to do February better this year than we've ever done before. And then we make a plan. Right. So that's bringing into that present. Change the association. Right. Yeah. So, but that's one of the, that's usually the first question I ask is like, what anniversary you got? Like what happened during November of blah, blah, blah year or any year? Is anything ever? And happened? I'm guessing when they ask that question, it'll be the first time they hear yep. of whatever happened. Yep. Right. Yeah. And it's, and it is a ha, ha moment. They're like, Oh my God, I never even thought of that, but they're actively thinking about the thing all the time, you know, and that's, you, we can translate to everyday life with people for that. Sure. Because, you know, in, like for instance, I will never forget July 14th, 2021, when my friend Bill passed away in my home. Yeah. That's always going to be there. So every year it's going to come up. It's what I do with it. That makes the difference of like, am I going to fall apart? Am I going to, you know, Sure. Right. Um, you know, people have, you know, people have deaths. That's the most common one is like the first Christmas. Then, you know, what do you do with all these emotional associations that go with a tragedy, a trauma, a thing? Yeah. Um, and that's and how do you process them? So they don't back up on you. So you don't become overwhelmed, feel hopeless, which is the number one sign and hallmark for someone to commit suicide. The level of hopelessness that comes up is what will be the predictor for whether someone will go through with something like that or not. The more hopeless someone feels that they have no other way of dealing with it and no other outs, that's when that comes. And I always tell people there's, for every time you think there's not something, there's seven other things you can do. And a lot of people are dealing with that past trauma on a hopeless basis right. because you can't change the you past, right? You can't go back right? and undo it. What can you do? Right. So and which is, that's what lots of veterans do. And I mean, anyone that suffers trauma at, a, at an intense level, like not like, acute trauma right or acute stress mm -hmm. but usually the bigger things they're constantly going into their head to try to go back and undo yeah i can't tell you how many veterans are seeking 
the thrill, the chase, the experience of the high of what it felt like to be in theater, knowing that they'll never experience that on the job. You know, that's why a lot of guys go into being police officers because they, it's the way to kind of get back, but it never, I'm always saying like, you're never going to get that experience that it was like to be over in Iraq. You're never going to get that experience. It's, it, it's just impossible to recreate that. It's kind of like a gambler trying to catch up though, isn't right. it? You, you're chasing. trying to continue that experience because right. you think somehow you can balance the books right. against that trauma. And well, it's the, and that's part of the addiction brain is we're yeah. addicted to the feeling of the experience that keeps us in a homeostatic you know, state. It's, but you have to let go of the, here's my phrase. You have to let go of the hope that you can go back and undo. Yeah. And people don't like that. Yeah. What do you mean I have to let go of the hope? You, well, you, you do have to let go of the hope that you can go back and undo that. Cause you know, intellectually, you can't undo it. You can't go back and fix it. You can't go back and change it. Um, but one of the best techniques that we, that, that I've used with, with um, people that have like dreams and, and the dreams of like, PTSD dreams is waking up and having them go, having them go back and complete it the way they want it. Mm. So how did it, how do you want it to end the way you wanted it to end versus the way it keeps ending in your head, which is a whole nother technique, but, but that's a way of fixing that in the moment, but it, you still can't go back and undo. And people know that intellectually, but our brains are wired right. that we have, we chase the feeling it's a dopamine rush. It's a dopamine rush. And now, and you know, when you're in that moment, you've had it over and over again, it's what the association neurons do. They keep bringing you over and over and over. The story of the old man uh, always dreaming about the fumble in his high school football game. Yep. You yep. know, just dealing with that constantly. Yep. Yep. Because it's traumatic to the brain emotionally that 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 didn't go the way they wanted it, or it didn't end the way they expected it, or whatever. But just accepting, you know, it's back to Bill. We're on the Cincinnati. Yep. You move on to Cincinnati. Yep. It's expect it's just accepting what's in the moment, which is really hard when you're talking about wartime and things like that. Sure. You know, it's like, what do you mean accepting? There you are there. There's nothing else that you can do. You can't be like, I'm out. <laughs> I think I'm gonna go get a drink. Yeah. <laughs> you got this. <laughs> Plus what happened 20 years ago happened 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. All you can do is deal with what's in front of you. And that doesn't mean you don't honor right. something in some way or you're, you know have the compassion and the empathy but it's like you have to have the compassion and empathy for yourself too if you were involved so that you can say i need to give myself a space here to be okay and there's so many people that don't do that yeah because they feel so incredibly responsible for things and that leads to long-term depression and long-term anxiety and you know depression is that that lack of of connection and lack of you know it's the dis-ease you know, disease, it's the dis-ease of being okay with oneself mm -hmm. and being able to connect in to feel okay because people feel shame, people feel guilt. I didn't do enough. I should have done this. Like there's so many pieces that go into 17 different shows that I could talk about. <laughs> yeah, but what's the athlete taught? We'll bring it back to the athlete. Yep. The athlete is taught, is taught th there's the next game. Right. You know, mm -hmm. there's the next at bat. There's the next, you know. which is why I tie those those two pieces of my work together is because yeah. my my sports resiliency brain and mindset growth mindset processing of how to make athletes mentally tough helps me help people in those conditions because oftentimes they are the people that I'm helping without that level of resiliency um, didn't have it in the first place. Whereas an athlete who's, you know, not like, I'm not talking like a, you know, young peewee t-ball player, but I'm talking like yeah. an athlete who's been an athlete for a while and is really, they have that mindset, or at least they have the basis for it. Whereas a lot of people, even if they were athletes and they went in to do all these sorts of things, their resiliency isn't quite there. Well, there's no other way. And to go back to your example, for an athlete, there is that repeat experience. For yeah. the military person, there's not that repeated right. experience. Right. It's you new. can't go back and make good. Right. You have a whole new life to right. build and, and obviously the stakes are a lot lower in everyday life than they are in the military right. theater. Well, but like, an athlete can ha get the next at bat. They can get the next game. They get a chance to redeem themselves. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's one of the things about like when you have someone that goes into the, you know, in theater and they go in overseas, you know, I say overseas cause that's where we have wars, but we go into theater and then, you know, your tour is over and it's like, okay, go back home and be normal. Whereas an athlete is like, I can still go back and, do this one more time. I can yeah. still go back and do something else that's like it and still make it good for me. Whereas you can't go back over to Afghanistan. You can't go back over to Iraq. You can't go back over. And, you know, and I, ugh, there's so many. 
And that's why they had that, you know, remember in Fort Bragg when those, you know, two or three of the guys came back in this what, decade or more ago when they came back and killed their whole families. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't because they were uh, wanting to kill their families is that they, no one ever debriefed them. No one ever, I mean, there's, I could go on forever about what didn't go right there, but you know, these yeah. guys weren't just like terrible, awful men. They had major issues with being, here you go. And now, oh, you did all these terrible, awful things. Yep. We're not going to talk about it. We're going to say, oh, good, you're exited out and now go back and be normal. Wait, what? Yeah. On a dime, like, you know, 24 hour turnaround kind of thing. Like, wait a second. And now your family makes a noise in the middle of the night and you shoot them. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm simplifying it, but, yep. you know, not all people do that, but you have these examples of where, like, that's at the extreme of, like, this is what it's like. We ask you to go do a job. Now you go over, you protect people, you shoot at people, you have to be on guard, be on guard, be on guard, always on alert, hyper vigilant, all this stuff. And then now you come home and have to be, you know, living in, you know, Plum Island, being yeah. normal. Yeah. Yeah. Bad example, but yeah. Well, you know, I was just yeah. trying to give like, you know, normal, normal America, yeah. except for you, Lou. Yeah. Well, no, I think Plum Island's a bad example of normal America. But that's another story. All right. So, you know, like Tewksbury, Massachusetts, yeah, sure. Bill Rick of Massachusetts. And that's a bad example, too. But, yeah. you know, just like you come home to be like, hey, you know, the, you know, the, the biggest thing that happens in town is someone, you know, stole a loaf of bread out of the it's cut, and it made the, the police log. Yeah. You know? Or someone, someone didn't wear a mask inside the store in Bedford, and they got in trouble. Oh uh, yeah, I know. You know, that's what we have to worry about. Yeah, well, yeah. That, and that's, I mean, I make fun, but that's true. You know, it's like this is what you know. You're on, you're in the field, you're getting shot at, and then 48 hours later, you're someone's getting in trouble for them not wearing a mask. Which is why a lot of them become cops. This is what I'm saying. Yeah. Right, because there's still some eventual charge there. I just, well, it gives I just you, had this whole show run through my head of like, oh, there's so many things. It's there. a life context that you can deal with because you have the tool set, right? The tools and the mindset to do it, right? Yeah, right. And right. if you and if you do, and if you have the tools, sometimes they sometimes the tools are there, but they're just a little askew. Yeah. Um. And 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 I love all the police police officers I work with, and and they tell me some interesting stories of other guys that aren't getting help, and that's one of the things that I've seen is that you know. You come out, you go into doing police work, for instance, and um, the perspective of being in the moment isn't there. They're still living in theater right? and every traffic stop, everything is combative, everything, right. you know, and then, and then people will say, oh, it's, you know, they get mad. It's the police. It's the police. Well, because sometimes some of the police officers are ready yeah. well, <laughs> to fight. Think about what a quote unquote traffic stop in Afghanistan would be what, like as opposed exactly. to a traffic, right. tra traffic stop in Tewksbury. And it's tough for them to differentiate the two. Right. And so that's what I try to explain to people when people are like, oh, the police are so whatever. I'm like, because they're not all wrong either. No. Every traffic stop that's could right. end and, any particular way. And, you know, and, 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 you know, I've had people say, well, then they shouldn't be police officers. I'm like, well, there's many people that didn't go over and serve that shouldn't be police officers. Like, you can't, yep. like, some people shouldn't be doing a lot of things. <laughs> it's about understanding that here's a context. And so, there's going to be some people that are much more strict as police officers based on their life experience of maybe being a military officer. True story. Some people are going to go one way and some people go the other. And so I would just tell people just to if you get pulled over. If something happens, you know, keep in context to be non-combative in general. <laughs> All right, quickly tell everybody about yes. the marathon and your fundraising efforts. Oh my goodness. Yes. If you look at the bottom of your screen and the link, okay. the link that you can click on is in the comments as well. The link that you click on is in the comments as well. Um, I am running for the New England Patriot Foundation for the Boston Marathon, which occurs on the 11th of October this year. I need to raise $10,000. I'm also, um, if I'm doing, um, if you donate $100 and you send it in, um, I am giving away um on the i think it's the 26th of september that game i think it was the saints patriots game i'm giving away a pair of tickets to the october 3rd game to the patriots bucks game at gillette um because i'm doing 100 squares so good lord you'll, you'll talk be... about trauma <laughs> <laughs> but regardless yeah <laughs> if you can't do a hundred dollars i don't care i just need you to give me money yeah. to help out a great foundation which is um the new england patriots foundation which helps 
26 local New England, all New England. We pick charities, usually two or 300 app apply a year. We pick 26 that are top notch for the year and we give $10,000 to each charity and the top charity that we pick gets $25,000 on top. So, and they get, you know, they get to go to that luncheon at the New England Patriots and so on and so forth and do all that stuff. But it's a great uh, cause because it helps veterans. Mm -hmm. It helps um, suicide prevention. It helps with people with domestic violence, animal causes, children causes, uh, women going to work. I mean, this year's 26 people uh, t t uh, foundation was like amazing. Like some of the work that's done is absolutely spectacular. Homelessness, uh, fighting all kinds of different diseases. I mean, you name it. So um, it's not just helping one, you know, so if you love helping lots of different things, this is a great way for your money to go towards that. Plus you're helping me be able to run for the New England Patriots. And it's so much fun. And in five weeks, I'll be meandering Excellent. down that course. So please, you know, um, give a hundred dollars or more. If you can. Therapy coming up to that Bucks game. <laughs> and and Lou. It's going to be a traumatic experience. Oh, geez. I'm going to have to do therapy for yeah. Lou. All right, you guys. And I will see you next week. Have a great week and weekend.